The Unshackled Waves, episode 107. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It was the final sitting week of Federal Parliament this week. We saw some major legislation passed in same-sex marriage, but also some major legislation announced with a crackdown on foreign donations planned. We will discuss the conclusion of the political year along with other news with The Unshackled senior editor, Damien Ferry. This is The Unshackled Waves Review Show. Damien, welcome back to the show. Hi, Tim. Good to be with you. Now, obviously, the the big uh, major story this week is same-sex marriage is now law in Australia. The House of Representatives passed the Dean Smith same-sex marriage bill uh, unamended. All efforts to protect uh, religious freedoms in the form of amendments were defeated. Uh, In the final vote, there was only four MPs who uh, voted no. There were... uh, from the current estimation 12 abstentions. So Mm -hmm. same-sex marriage, it became legal on December 9 after uh, receiving royal assent the the previous day. Now overseas, same-sex marriages are now instantly recognised and uh, same-sex couples have started giving their 30 days notice to uh, wed. And looking at the laws, laws in specifics, Uh, marriage is now the union of uh, two people and the term uh, spouse can be used instead of husband or wife and uh, gender on birth certificates can now be uh, changed without the need for a heterosexual couple to uh, divorce. Yes. Um, now, um, when, when it comes to, uh, obviously, like you stated about uh, the 30 days notice, so the 9th of January is going to be uh, the official day where people can start getting married um, under same-sex marriages. Um, the spouse issue is an interesting one because it does raise um, gender fluidity uh, uh, issues. Um, I mean, instead of using uh, two men, two women, man and woman, if you use the word spouse, it, it automatically cancels the male and female out of the, the actual uh, contract. So um, it's already using a neutral term. So that could be a, a further sort of, how can I say, uh, pushing of, of their agenda going down that way to try and minimise the, the male and female usage of words. And obviously there's a lot of um, uh, other things at stake. Now, um, the four people that voted against uh, the, the same-sex marriage in Parliament House was Keith Pitt, Russell Broadbent, Bob Catter and David Littleproud. Now, those four people are only four people because there was many other uh, abstains, 12 abstains that you mentioned. And a lot of those guys that abstained were, were seen as conservative, fierce warriors. You had people like Tony Abbott, uh, George Christensen, and also um, uh, the young Western Australian. Um, also, um, Yeah, Andrew Hasty, that's the one. And, and I mean, these guys here are, are really seen as like, Voices and 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 there were the big no campaign um, campaigners that uh, that really went out there and uh, put their voice out there, but um, I I think there's there's a bit of a feeling, especially amongst the no campaign, that these guys uh, are a bit gutless really to to not at least uh, put their say and, and vote no and instead abstain because even though there's the argument to be made that. Uh, a lot of their electorates voted uh, as a yes vote, um, they still could have really stood firm and, and held on to their convictions. And I think people would have really appreciated it. And the four people that did hold their uh, their views and, and make sure that they voted, no, I don't think will be affected at the following election because by then people would have forgotten about... Um, uh, the whole issue altogether, there would be other issues on the plate. So I, I think they could have uh, stepped out and, and, and chose to vote no rather than abstained. Well, yeah, the reason they chose to abstain, I think, is because their electorates uh, voted yes. And so they, they they didn't feel that they could vote against their electorates. Uh, but mm. 
There, there was there, Andrew Hasty said that he was going to vote no to um, same sex marriage uh, period. Uh, I think mm. there would have been a few other people in the abstentions who uh, weren't uh, comfortable with the uh, same sex marriage bill in its final form, given that uh, all the amendments to to protect religious freedoms had been defeated. Uh, probably mm. Tony Abbott would have uh, voted yes if some of those amendments had passed, and maybe. Uh, Michael Suker and a few others, but because it was, mm. you know, pr uh, pretty much the uh, you know, minimalist uh, uh, change uh, to to the Marriage Act, uh, they felt that they couldn't support that. But then again, they didn't want to go against their electorates. Yeah, um, in in regards to George Christensen, he was one person that uh, definitely stood up and said uh, to the gallery, the, the the people in the gallery that were cheering on uh, the yes side, that they were really cheering on a destruction of religious freedoms. And Bob Catter's speech, another one, was really um, passionate uh, about his views and, and uh, basically said that when people uh, were to come out of the city and into the bush where real people were in the pub, that uh, they had very different views um, to ones in the, in the inner city. So... Um, the the argument to be made really is uh, how about the Labor MPs that chose to vote yes, even though they had a, a 70% uh, no vote in their electorates. I mean, I think those guys there might have a harder time to retain their seats than the ones uh, in the yes areas, especially since the yes vote won, uh, meaning that uh, the, the people in the no voting areas uh, might be um, a little bit uh, peed off I guess you could say at the next election, and might and might be able to uh, vote otherwise because these are, are very strong Labor seats. But when it came to this issue, uh, the working class um, ethnic communities are really um, against this, and the Labor Party uh, people in there aren't really representing their seats. Yeah, it'll be interesting yeah, next election whether whether there is any uh, backlash. Uh, uh, to to their decisions, especially in uh, J uh, Jason Clare, who's in Blacksland, his seat was seventy five percent no. So certainly, uh, yes, those MPs they have still have the entitlement to vote the way they want. But uh, time will tell. Um, you know whether they're held you know accountable for uh, going against their constituents like that. They probably argue that uh, Australia as a whole uh, said yes, and so. Um, you know, they, they did the, uh, the right thing by uh, the majority of people. But uh, uh, then mm. again, that's, uh, uh, that's disputable. Other people will disagree with that. Well, time will definitely tell, I think. I mean, um, it, it's just su that was such a big vote, really. And it was all concentrated mainly in Western Sydney. And um, I think it really has broken the stereotype that uh, poor people tend to be... Um, progressive and rich people tend to be conservative. I think that's really breaking stereotypes here because really when you look down to it, apart from the Liberal and Labor voting records of these seats, the upper class areas were very, very strong yes votes. When you had uh, Tony Abbott's electorate in the 70 plus mark um, and then ones in uh, such as Malcolm Turnbull's electorate, um, the, the Sydney and Grainler seats uh, in Sydney, those areas there were all in, in the 80% mark of, of a yes vote. Uh, but then when you go into Western Sydney, which are labour areas, it's totally the opposite. So I think um, people are confused because they, they tend to um, really base their votes on economic issues rather than the social ones. But I think a vote like uh, the same-sex marriage one really has opened people's eyes and thought, OK, um, is this party really uh, representing who I am as a person? And um, not only basing it on one issue um, of economics, but a, a range of different issues, whether it be um, social issues, immigration issues. Um, it just seems to me that um, the, the idea or the stereotype that we grow up with, that uh, the, the rich are conservative and the, the poor are, are very progressive, um, seem to be very, um, yeah, it just doesn't seem to be a reality. But back to same-sex marriage. Now, there's been a lot of talk about 
you know, what's what's next on the the left's agenda because uh, they obviously feel, although the, you know, same-sex marriage movement wasn't made up entirely of uh, uh, left-wing people, uh, the left certainly claimed it as a victory of their own and they obviously feel, you know, empowered by their, uh, uh, what they see as their victory. Now, it was interesting mm -hmm. in, in the 24 hours immediately, there was an article published saying that, well, they, they didn't use the term safe schools, but they, say, uh, they said uh, LGBTQ, uh, how many uh, of, uh, extra letters there are now, inclusive mm -hmm. uh, education, which is, uh, and they didn't, uh, yeah, this was done by an, uh, an academic who, uh, it wasn't, they didn't just want a, you know, anti-bullying program, they wanted you know, like gay sex education. Uh, and if you mm. read that article, it talks about, you know, the ch uh, children, they should learn about, you know, of uh, sexual pleasure. Like it's like, it's pretty blatant in that's what they want. And they obviously felt that now was the time to promote this. Yes, yes. I, I did see that article and um, a lot of people have posted that article on saying, oh, it's only been a day and they, they, they got stuck right into it. They didn't even give it a, uh, a bit of a rest break. Um, but, I mean, this, this was something that was bound to happen because it, all the dominoes are falling um, eventually. And you might be able to, um, in, in theory, support same-sex marriage, but then a lot of people, when you look at things that are, are bound to happen uh, later on, then it, it, it might give people a, a bit of a different opinion or thought. And even though they did win quite strongly, um, now a lot of people are going to have to face these consequences um, that they may not have known about or um, that at the time they didn't believe were going to happen. And, I mean, one step that's definitely going to happen soon, I would say, is... Um, to uh, include uh, polyamorous relationships in marriages. I think that's uh, something that's inevitable. Um, and I actually uh, see a lot of support on the internet for that. Um, whether people believe in it or not, it's up to them. But um, there is a lot of uh, people in groups and, and everything that um, say um, basically that if you have um, two men or two women marrying, that um, as long as it's consent, um, that, you know, anyone can marry. If you want to marry, you know, five people, ten people, it wouldn't matter as long as it's consenting adults. So using that argument, I mean, it seems to me that polyamorous relationships um, soon enough will uh, be incorporated. I don't know if it's going to take five years, ten years, but I don't think it would be... Um, any more than a decade and we would have it in there for sure. Um, anything else after that, uh, it would take longer to, um, I mean, there's, there's the argument that you could uh, have bestiality and um, and things like uh, people marrying objects and, and all, all that sort of thing, you know, down the line, maybe marrying robots, you know, you, you just wouldn't know. But um, polyamorous relationships definitely is going to be something that happens quite soon, I think. Uh, I, I think, you know, if you know, bestiality, like marrying objects. I, I, I don't think that's ever going to happen, uh, ever. Mm. Like, certainly there'll be, you know, discussions about uh, polyamory, but I think it's mm. something that the political class won't go near, uh, basically mm. because of the fact that they can't be certain that uh, polyamorous marriages, given like it, uh, how they operate in Islam, for example, uh, there's no yeah. way that the politicians could be... Uh, convinced that, you know, these types of marriages would be uh, consensual. Mm, that, that's, that's, that's definitely right. I, I just, um, I mean, these are things that could possibly happen, but it takes generations for these things to come into place. I mean, if you look back 50 years, what we've had 50 years ago to now, a lot has changed, a very big lot of things have changed, and nobody would have thought anything of it back then. Um, so it, it's very difficult to rule out. I mean, Polyamorous definitely is, is going to be within a decade there. I, I don't, I don't doubt it. I, I know that there is, as you said, some pressure amongst people that might think there might be consensual issues, especially amongst some uh, particular groups of people. But I think it's something that will uh, end up um, getting incorporated. There's already ABC articles on uh, polyamorous relationships, and they are starting to promote it a little bit as a next kind of because with the left, they have to find find something else now to, to focus on. So they've already had SSN 
granted. So they'll, they'll find other things to, because this is the definition of progressivism. When you're a progressive person, you, you want continual change. So you're going to have to latch onto new objectives to uh, new social justice things that, um, you know, have to be incorporated into laws um, to change for the sake of change. Um, so it's definitely, um, you know, it's very hard to rule out, really, because, you know, 50 years ago, people would have ruled out anything happening here that we we've currently have. Um, when it comes to the actual campaign, I know I know we have to sort of, um, what, where do we go from here, you know, and, and how, how, how should no voters really react to, to how the campaign's gone? And it's, it's very hard to pinpoint. I mean, the, the campaign on the no side was very sensible and, professional almost a little bit too much the the yes side really i mean it was a disastrous i would say it was disastrous and it was really feral but they ended up winning see because when you look at votes or uh, elections nobody wins when they go on positive platforms now it might be the ethical thing to do but people like dirty politics i mean them you know they'll, they'll say oh you know we don't like our politicians talking dirty and stuff but as soon as the dirty advertisement comes out the slanderous and you know the the, the negative advertising that's what wins it and the, the left were good at that you know they were going out there you know smashing billboards you know abusing people and we all thought that that was going to work against them but it didn't and i i don't know i mean if the if the no campaign did the same thing the media would have attacked them hard for it but would it have maybe improved their vote it's just it's just very hard to say i, I just think they were too polished and and just too sensible for their own good in a way you know uh i i certainly feel that the the, the campaign itself uh the the opinion polls didn't really change uh, through, mm. uh throughout the uh, the campaign. I mean, it was always roughly about you know sixty forty. The the yes campaign certainly went off the rails. Uh, you know, uh, early on. Um, you know, with you know the uh, their left fringe uh, being pretty feral. But I did notice mm. in the in the final month or so that they actually believe it or not the the left actually learned how to behave. Like they didn't you know <laughs> whenever they saw a no campaign uh, you know uh, get uh, get. Uh, get triggered which was you know I, I i was you know quite impressed by which you know probably um you know sa saved them uh in those uh final weeks uh but mm -hmm. uh, given that uh the the no campaign it was basically about issues such as you know safe schools and uh religious uh freedoms and it was mm -hmm. and the reason why you know i voted yes and i think that uh you know uh, a lot of other people voted yes is because they, you know, just looked at the issue of itself, which was should the law be changed to allow, you know, same-sex couples to marry. I mean, a lot of people who voted yes, you know, would be concerned about, you know, religious freedom and safe schools. Mm. I, I didn't like the no campaign saying they were, a, you know, packaged deal because I, I don't think it's inevitable that, uh, you know, they, uh, these things... Uh, you know, uh, more safe schools and the destruction of religious freedom is inevitable. They can they can still be fought, and I hope that mm. the the government's inquiry into religious freedoms, which will report you know March next year, like it just doesn't you know get um you know chucked on a shelf somewhere. I I hope there there is some yeah. you know a action from it, and I I still think that uh, you know the a lot of you know parents are uncomfortable with. You know, uh, safe schools, and I actually saw a story today that uh, Labor power brokers are actually wanting to tell Daniel Andrews to shut up about safe schools. Ah, that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, I just uh, I'm very skeptical on it because uh, I just know how they work, and I what my opinion on on, on it was. I okay, we'll shelve it to next year. And by next year, everybody will forget about it and we'll just sort of, you know, bring up other issues. And, I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. If, if Turnbull's really um, going really badly, they, and, and just say the, the citizen, uh, citizenship issue, there could be something that triggers an election. Say Shorten becomes Prime Minister next year, um, that would just scrap the whole religious issues altogether and uh, he wouldn't touch it and it will all be forgotten about. And that, that's, that's the sort of... Uh, the thing that we have to be careful on that because they didn't sort it out um, in December when they were putting uh, same sex marriage into parliament and they chose to do it separately, that uh, it could be later forgotten about and just um, altogether just left out of it, you know? 
Oh, well, while we've got a you know coalition government, we can you know have mm. hope. But given that Labour MPs they they weren't bound uh, bound for the actual same sex marriage vote, but they were to vote down all the amendments, which was uh, pretty disgraceful. You definitely know that mm. under Labour that you know religious freedom is going to be trashed, and you know Bill Shorten in the last election you know said he wanted an LGBT commissioner in the the Human Rights Commission. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Uh, where, where do you think personally um, that the 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 no campaign can learn from this? Uh, give another campaign. Do you think that uh, the the answer is to go a little bit more harder? Because, like I was saying before, they might have been a little bit too PC um, in their advertising. They they did mention safe schools and um, and issues like that, but they they still. They they could have went further. They didn't have the the very emotive advertising. They didn't have the sort of um, the the real sort of scary sort of you know mention of pedophilia or anything like that. I mean, that of course you know people could say that's bizarre to bring it up, but it's it's things that they could have used to uh, encourage people to sway their way. You know, like scaremongering tactics, and they were really sensible in not bringing up things like that. But would it have maybe? Um, brought more people to their side of thinking uh, by being more emotive, more negative, more, um, a little bit more uh, extreme. I, I felt that, you know, because all of the advertising was about, you know, sa uh, safe schools, that they'd already mm. conceded that the Australian people were okay with uh, same-sex marriage, which you know, when, when you can see that, you know, the issue that the, the vote is about is, uh, you know, okay, then you're already... Um, you, you're you're already behind, and so uh, uh, which uh, given given that strategy, uh, it's not a surprise that the the vote was the the result uh, that it was. Um, but I also think that the no campaign they shouldn't have like they they shouldn't feel that you know everything uh, you know uh, they uh, they put every, everything on the table on uh, this vote. I mean mm. it's. You know, it's it's not the the end of everything. I mean, you know, uh, a, a same sex wedding, you know, by by itself, like, is you know, is not is not the end for you know all these other issues. There's still you know a, a lot of uh, issues that no, uh, no campaigners you know are you know passionate about that they can still you know co convince the public. I don't think this you know was the um, you know winner takes all uh, vote. Mm. It was quite a busy week uh, for the final week of Parliament. Uh, also uh, announced was the uh, federal government's proposed foreign donation laws, which uh, under this uh, these proposed laws, all foreign donations will be banned not just from political parties, but also from uh, political campaigning. And it'll also be, there'll be a new offence to make it illegal to undermine the, the national interest through the political process. And there will also be a, a foreign interest registry for lobbyists who um, are acting on behalf of foreign governments. Now, the uh, Turnbull government, they're obviously uh, wanting to uh, target uh, people like Sam Dasty Ari, who actually uh, t uh, took a personal uh, donation from uh, an entity associated with the the Chinese uh, government to pay his uh, travel expenses, which uh, got him sacked from the Labor front bench the first time. And they also want to target uh, groups uh, such as Get Up, who do receive some funding from. Uh, overseas now, uh, obviously, if, you know, especially in this day and age, uh, people are uh, Australians are very worried about you know foreign uh, governments and agents you know trying to influence Australian uh, policy. But it's you know for for me like uh, you know do uh, political donations they're 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 free speech uh, uh, I believe because and. You know, you're really like it's, they say they're going to target you know any organisation that engages in political campaigns. That's pretty much uh, opens the door that you know even like charities, if they express a view you know about a public policy issue, are they going to be you know audited to see if they have you know a, any foreign you know contributions? It, it really you know could really uh, you know undermine 
you know, a lot of, um, you know, community uh, activism and community work in Australia? I think the right is very uh, divided on this issue, to be honest. I, I think you have your more liberal libertarian types that are very, uh, um, I guess they see it as a free speech issue, that people should be able to uh, donate where they like and, and have no sort of uh, um, regulation in place to, to, to limit that. And then you've got your more uh, nationalistic uh, types that, um, like the left, would uh, be um, for banning such influence because... I guess the way they would see it is that once you allow um, big um, multinationals or, or, or people with a lot of money uh, to buy influence, um, a lot of corruption could then therefore take place. And our politicians, um, especially in the Sam Dastyari case, I think that's really um, a scary thing because, I mean, he is dealing with a communist country and um, basically um, was getting involved in something that he had no business getting involved in, in the South China Sea debate, and then was telling them, oh, look, you know, let's talk outside. You know, we don't want this recorded. It, it was just, it was unbelievable that uh, somebody can get away with such a thing. I mean, I imagine if somebody on the right did so, did such a thing, you know. I mean, they'd be long gone. And, and Shorten sacks him from the uh, the ministry, but he's already sacked him a couple of times from the ministry. He'll give him a rest break and then he'll put him back on there uh, rather than actually getting rid of him altogether. He's, he, he has no idea. He's very, very, very much a loose cannon. And um, he, he seems like he thinks his, his uh, position is, uh, is somewhat uh, mafia-like and that he, he can go um, to, to different business people and, and sort of you know pull strings and control things. Uh, I think he, he doesn't really understand what he's... Uh, what his job entails as a politician in representing uh, people in his electorate and in his country. I mean, to deal with a, a communist country like China and nobody says anything, I mean, you could only imagine if um, if um, someone on the right was doing the same in Russia, you know? I mean, what, what, what kind of... Uh, I mean, obviously, you, you see the, the issues brought up with um, the Russia and, and the Trump situation. And, I mean, you know, Im imagine someone, someone on the right going to Russia and doing the same thing, how, how big of a story it would be. Oh, well, somebody from the right has been uh, caught up in this uh, uh, foreign donation uh, crackdown, and that's former Trade Minister Andrew Robb, who is now uh, a lobbyist uh, for a um, Chinese-aligned uh, company. And uh, I, I mm. think they've, mm. they, they've tried, the Turnbull government, they've tried to, you know, uh, and make it clear that, you know, this is not, you know, we just want to get Sam Dastyari and get up. They've also said, you know, if we, you know, if Andrew Robb, you know, he should be put on this foreign, you know, interest registry as well. You know, we have, you know, going to show him uh, no favoritism and he's been uh, quite, you know, pissed off about that and, you know, saying how, how dare you, you know, call me a, a traitor. Um, I, you know, like, like I said, like, you know, f not all, you know, foreign donations are, I think if they are, you know, f you know, being funneled by a foreign government, that is mm -hmm. definitely uh, problematic. But, you know, say if it's, you know, just a, uh, you know, company which, you know, operates in Australia and has, um, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, operations in Australia and, you know, mm -hmm. they're, 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 you know, obviously, you know, employing Australian people, you know, got Australian managers, uh, I think I think that's a bit different from you know a um, you know an entity which is you know wanting to you know uh, actually you know of uh, going of uh, denigrate Australia's public policy in favour of a mm -hmm. a foreign government. I think that's a you know really uh, different different case. Yeah, yeah, it definitely um, is. When when it comes to politics, it's such much a so much of a greater uh, situation here and. And like I said, I mean, the fact that it's a communist country, I mean, you, you, you just you just think to yourself, I mean, it, it's just really crazy. Like, I mean, um, it, it seems like a, a, a very big double standard here. Like, I mean, obviously, we haven't got any countries that, that are outright uh, fascist ones. But I mean, you can only hypothetically, you know, think of, of the different kind of reaction it would be. But, um, you know, to, to deal with a country like China in such a manner is, is um, disgraceful. It's really uh, 
uh, foolish on his behalf and it, it seems like he's untouchable, a bit of an endangered species because in the Labor Party he's so protected, um, seeing as he's uh, uh, backed Shorten and, and basically been one of the, the main guys to put him in his place in the first place, Shorten knows not to remove him because he he was the one who put him in there, you know, so that, that's how politics works, unfortunately. Um, within, a gov- uh, within a company, sorry, um, it, it is different. But again, you do have a bit of a divide on the right with your um, with your liberal types and your more populist types, see, because uh, things have really changed over um, over the, the coming years with the the rise of uh, nationalist type of politics, and um, these people um, don't want any foreign ownership or uh, or influence from overseas countries at all, whereas um, uh, liberal minded people do. So it's it's um, definitely. The dynamics of the political spectrum and um, ideologies, they're, they're really starting to shift around a little bit. And um, I think uh, within parties, there's going to be splits, divides. You see the Liberal parties, I mean, it's, 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 it's really split on, on many issues that, that you've got, you know, two dominant ideologies that um, in many ways contradict each other on a lot of issues. Um, Labor Party, not not as much, but um, again, you know, you will get a situation where, um, um, I mean, look at it in the Greens. You've got you've got the Tories and the and the communists, um, the communist party uh, party um, section of of the and and I mean they stacked around and not long ago. See, so you, you've got these splits in the parties over such issues. Um, it's it's really affecting affecting how uh, how things uh, the dynamics of the spectrum and and how things are really. I definitely think that the the Dastyari case is, you know, uh, different because, you know, he has, you know, I've, as we've found out, openly tried to undermine Australia's national interest. I mean, there was that story in the Daily Telegraph that he'd, uh, during Senate estimates, uh, asked Australian defence officials uh, no less than 115 times about the uh, the South China Sea. And, yes, like tipping off the... Um, uh, the Chinese businessman, uh, Wang Zhengmo, that, you know, his phone was being bugged by Asia. I mean, that is, you know, cl- pre- pretty close to, um, you know, uh, f- uh, you know uh, tre- treasonous behaviour. That you know, Yeah. And, and so it, de- it definitely is, you know, uh, Dast- uh, Dastyari, he, you know, he hasn't just uh, accepted money. He's, you know, acted against, you know, Australia's interest and gone against our... Uh, you know what our security agencies are advising, and it's um, you know, and and obviously you know Bill Shorten, he said that you know Dastyari's uh, career is going nowhere fast. Uh, well, mm-hmm. you know, you wonder when he uh, when Shorten will uh, try and uh, speed up his uh, career again. But you know, certainly, <laughs> um, at least uh, at least the the coalition, they're not going to let this go, and have referred you know Dastyari to the 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 privileges committee. You know, I don't think we need a you know a crackdown on you know donations period yeah. uh, i think yeah. we just need to yeah, like i said make make sure that you know behavior such as you know desiari there needs to be you know some sort of crackdown on you know actions such as that well desiari like all politicians only act in their own interests um and that, that's how it works so uh I mean, um, yeah, he's been caught out, but uh, hasn't hasn't really had any tough punishments over it. So, I mean, back in 2009, we thought Turnbull was done and dusted, and now he's Prime Minister. So, I mean, you know, give it a few years, and, you know, they'll think people all forgotten, and, you know, everything's nice and dandy. I mean, who knows? I mean, if, if Shorten becomes Prime Minister, or even if there's a change in leadership, Sam, D- Sam Dastyari... Uh, he, he might end up being uh, a minister again or even, you know, like um, in a high position. So um, I can definitely not rule out that he's going to um, all of a sudden, you know, uh, have the, uh, uh, you know, the by principle say, oh, you know, I've done the wrong thing, thing and I should remove myself from the parliament. That's definitely not going to happen. So I think we're going to be seeing a lot more from him. MPs from both houses uh, had to lodge their uh, citizenship declarations. And so now we have Labor MPs 
uh, Josh Wilson, Justine Key, David Feeney, Susan Lamb, along with uh, Senator Katie Gallagher, are referred to the High Court. And also uh, Nick Xenophon team uh, MP Rebecca Sharkey has also uh, been referred to the High Court. Now, Labor and the crossbench uh, in the lower house tried to move that Liberal MPs, uh, Julia Banks, Jason Flinsky, Alex Hawke, and Nola Marino be also referred to the High Court. And uh, the, uh, the government, uh, they were lucky that uh, Barnaby Joyce's uh, re-election uh, uh, to and New England was exhilarated. He uh, was able to return uh, to the Parliament on uh, Wednesday, only a few days after the by-election. So they had the numbers on the floor of the Parliament again, and they were able to uh, defeat Labor's uh, motion to refer their MPs to the High Court. And it seems that they did this uh, basically because uh, Julia Banks, who suspected she might have Greek citizenship, she's in a marginal seat in Victoria, Chisholm, which she um, she actually won off the Labor Party at the last election because uh, uh, the former Speaker Anna Burke retired and given the, the polls as they are at the moment, uh, they would be guaranteed to, to lose that seat. Um, you know, and, and it's clear, like, the, the citizenship declarations were supposed to, you know, clear once and for all, uh, you know, who was eligible to sit there and not. But, uh, you know, the parties, they're still playing politics and there is still largely... Uh, protection racket in place. I mean, Labor claimed for months that their processes were thorough and, you know, all their MPs would be fine, but, you know, they're obviously exposed yet again. And, you know, Bill Shorten, um, you know, has been, you know, left red faced. It seems like a, an issue that both parties have been playing politics with and that they're not really serious about. They've just been uh, holding off and uh, trying to, um, make political uh, points on the other team and make sure that they've, you know, gotten them, uh, that they've uh, been the ones to have members uh, put forward to the high court and that they were safe and, you know, trying to, um, it's just a, a big, a big game really. Yes. I mean, Chisholm's definitely going to go. I mean, um, no question asked. Uh, it's, it's an electorate that's really holding on uh, as a marginal and um, yeah, under, under circumstances of a by-election, they'll be gone. Um, so, you know, th this is, definitely going to affect um the party i mean that what a what an issue really that that it's it's ruined lives uh, so to speak amongst so many uh politicians but this is what happens when people don't uh really read into things and and follow the the laws whether you agree with them or not i mean that that is uh the, the current um circumstance that we're in and uh, it seems that people, when they uh, put themselves as candidates, don't actually really read into things properly. And uh, and this is what happens. And, I mean, we could only imagine that if the first uh, um, candidate um, that was a Green that uh, went forward and actually brought this issue up, then uh, if he never did, then we may be in a situation where uh, who knows how many years it would have taken for, for the issue to come up at all. Well, David Feeney is obviously the uh, Labor MP who's uh, embarrassed the, the party in the, the biggest way, given that he claims that he renounced his uh, British and Irish citizenship when he first ran for uh, the Senate in 2007. Uh, but mm. the only problem is now that is that he can't find the the, the paperwork. It's been uh, it's been called the you know the dog ate my homework uh, excuse. And imagine <laughs> how the you know the High Court is going to view that. Now, obviously, you know David Feeney. This is not his first uh, stuff up during last year's uh, federal election. He forgot to declare that he had a, a two million uh, dollar investment property and also during that camp campaign he uh, didn't know the difference between the baby bonus and the school kids bonus and so didn't know Labor's mm. policy mm. on them and not only that he left uh, confidential uh, Labor briefing papers uh, behind uh, from a media conference so IWM you know forgetful Feeney mm. now he survived this long like Dastiari because he um, is, a, is a major power broker in Victoria, um, but, mm -hmm. but it's interesting that uh, even uh, even now, um, you know, the, the rest of the uh, uh, Labor people in Victoria, they've uh, given this, uh, you know, forgetting his paperwork, they've finally, you know, cracked the shits with him. And, you know, mm -hmm. if they do have to go to a by-election, because he's in the inner Melbourne seat of Batman, which takes in mm -hmm. the state... 
uh, seat of Northcote, which the the Greens recently won at a by election. Uh, if that if that went to a by election, there's you know uh, more likely than not the the Greens would win it uh, because Liberals are not uh, would not run who would be able to deliver the Labor Party uh, preferences. And I don't think the voters that uh, uh, Batman would really want to vote back in the the guy who. Um, you know, for, force them back to the polls because he couldn't find his paperwork. Yeah, it's a very uh, inconvenient situation, isn't it? Uh, the the old paperwork story. Um, <laughs> but this is what happens when people are unorganised as such. You know, I just um, he's really a dud candidate. And I mean, you you actually look at the records. Labor's held the seat for for a long, long time. I mean, um, apart from a couple of years of being an independent, it wasn't since the 30s that they, they didn't hold the seat. I mean, it's a strong Labor seat, but with the Greens vote uh, being um, so much that it is, I mean, the Greens actually polled uh, higher than Labor in the primary vote by about a percentage point, but after preferences just crossed the line on a 51% margin. I mean, <laughs> there's no doubt that he'll be gone after this if he was to, uh, if he was to uh, be in a by-election. And um, he would definitely lose. I mean, the, the Greens are, are making roads here. Uh, they they won uh, the Brisbane seat, obviously, Maywa, and um, they'll definitely gain this one as well. It, um, it's very shocking, and how Labor's going to actually be able to cope with it is, um, is something that they're going to have to deal with. Malcolm Turnbull, he is finishing the year on a high. I mean, like he's obviously pleased that you know he you know got his you know precious same sex marriage uh, through. Mm. But there's also a lot of other people uh, in the government who are pleased that this issue is you know off the uh, agenda. And uh, given that um, you know after you know there was the the George Christensen threat, the the big guns came out to defend Malcolm Turnbull's leadership. Obviously, Barnaby Joyce on New England. Uh, by election night, you know, said, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, working with, you know, um, this bloke. And obviously John Howard, you know, was a big intervention mm. saying, you know, liberals need to stick with uh, Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, yeah, I, do, I, I, I don't hold much hope that, you know, Malcolm Turnbull has the capacity to turn it around, but it does look mm-hmm. like his, his leadership is secure going into the, to, to the new year. So, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't think Shorten's going to be, you know, riding high for, you know, up until the next election. Yeah, I, I believe Turnbull is safe too. And um, there really isn't any um, alternative to go to because even though there's many uh, great contenders in the Liberal Party, there could uh, possibly be a, um, a leadership uh, contender or a prime minister in future. Um People don't want to continue seeing these leadership changes at all. And it doesn't, it only does damage to them. I mean, it was wrong for Turnbull to toss Abbott out in the first place, um, in 2013. And we've actually seen that Turnbull at, at current is doing a lot worse than Abbott ever did. But, um, people, um, will think worse of it if he was replaced with somebody else, even if they were better, because the party has a stain on it. It's nothing to do, or not entirely to do with the leadership, as bad as a leader might be, but it's the brand. You know, it's the brand that, that uh, needs reforming, that um, people need to start trusting again, rather than just the leader. I mean, um, because it's a team effort. It's not just to do with the leader. And um, as bad as a leader is, um, there's also treasurers, there's immigration ministers, there's people that are, um, are putting out policies out there that are affecting the people. So Turnbull is safe, and I think he will be the leader next election because I don't think it would be a um, a positive for the Liberal Party to switch at all, given um, it doesn't work in their favour, as it didn't work in their favour last time when they did it to Abbott, and we've seen a decline in the party ever since. Um, so really, it's um, it, the next election is really um, looking to be a shortened victory accordingly, un- unless something really scandalous or, or something terrible happening in the Labor Party. It's going to be a very cruisy sort of uh, win for them, I think. The United States President Donald Trump had a, a busy week. Uh, it began with his former National Security Advisor, Michael Flynn, pleading guilty to lying to the FBI, and he will now cooperate with uh, uh, Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller's uh, investigation into uh, potential uh, you know, Russian uh, collusion with the Trump campaign. 
Uh, now, uh, again, like the uh, Trump's enemies think that, you know, this is the smoking gun to, you know, bring him down. But so far, we've never seen any concrete evidence, evidence that, you know, the Trump campaign colluded uh, with, with Russia uh, during the election. It more seems that, you know, Mueller, he's trying to, you know, pick off, um, you know, tr uh, Trump's uh, allies to see if he can get mm -hmm. them to... To dish the dirt on them but you know so far uh, so far it just seems like you know he's finding you know dodgy things that you know michael flynn has done and also his uh, former campaign manager paul manafort but yeah it just seems to be like this is you know uh, it's it's not going anywhere like obviously the media laps this up but you know it's you know flynn may have turned but you know let's see what he comes up with yeah i think it's um I think there's a lot of people out there that can't really accept uh, election results and they um, just want to uh, find any excuse to, to be able to remove somebody that has been elected. So um, they'll, they'll continue uh, digging at him um, and it doesn't seem to really have affected him that much as, as of yet. Um, whether they find anything is, um, is something to, to, to look out for. But uh, I think it's just um, really the the sore loser kind of mentality of many people that can't accept results. I mean, um, and th this is why they keep on trying to find things to, um, to be able to uh, criticize and uh, therefore remove him on. And, but he had a big victory this week, uh, Trump with his, uh, uh, travel ban on seven Muslim majority countries being upheld by the U S uh, Supreme Court. Now this follows uh, months of it being uh, thwarted since it was enacted back in January by activist judges in the, the federal court because we have to remember, you know, eight years under Obama, he appointed all these you know, liberal uh, justices to the, the federal courts in the United States. But the Supreme Court is still majority conservative. Um, so mm. he, you know, eventually has won this issue, but there's still a whole bunch of other parts of the travel ban which are still caught up in these federal courts. But uh, eventually he will get, uh, you know, the travel ban uh, in its uh, entire, entirely, even though it has been revised several times, you know, approved by the Supreme Court, which is a huge victory, uh, you know, and allows him to fulfill his election commitment to, you know, strengthen uh, US border control, not just, you know, south of the border, but, you know, uh, what's coming in on planes as well. Yeah, it's, it's a good idea to be able to um, keep an eye on um, countries that don't obviously... Uh... Um, share the same values and that um, many of the flock in the countries um, that um, many of those people don't come to then try and change your country according to their lifestyles that differ to yours in the first place. Now, um, when I look at the actual countries involved, um, there's uh, Chad, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria and Yemen. Um, now, there is still a lot of countries, obviously, um, that haven't been um, named, like Saudi Arabia, for instance, um, that has a lot of uh, extremism. Um, Iraq hasn't been mentioned as, a, as another country. So there, there has been um, a selection of countries, um, for instance, such as um, um, Chad and Libya, that haven't really had a great deal of, um, of threats from, but are in the list. So um, I... I I don't know why exactly um, particular countries were chosen and others weren't. I mean, um, there might be some theories out there as to why that is the case, but um, there are some countries that haven't been mentioned that would have been uh, ideal to, to add to the list, but just haven't been there. And obviously Trump's uh, biggest uh, announcement of the week was that he was moving the United States Embassy uh, in Israel from uh, Tel Aviv to the city of mm. Jerusalem. Now, this has uh, provoked uh, unrest in, in the Middle East. There's been uh, riots. It's also been condemned by nations such as uh, Turkey and Russia and also by uh, the European Union. Now, uh, you mm. know, this has been lauded by, uh, you know, tr uh, Trump's uh, supporters and many conservatives because it, you know, is... Uh, it is, you know, recognizing that, you know, Jerusalem, you know, is the uh, capital of uh, Israel. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it's basically a form of, you know, virtue signaling, which is really on a practical level, 
you know, unnecessary. I mean, you know, uh, and I'm the last person to, um, you know, argue, uh, you know, don't offend Muslims or they'll attack us. But, you know, why, why you know, yeah, does it, like, for practicality reasons, like, the, you know, Israeli embassy in uh, Tel Aviv has been working quite well. I mean, um, you know, does it really have to go to Jerusalem? Because previous presidents had always promised this, but, you know, never followed through with it because they didn't feel it was necessary. Well, it just seems like you uh, mentioned um, to be something that was unnecessary and, um, and, and really had no gain um, to, well, nothing to gain from it. It just, uh, I mean, it's um, it's one of those things that um, it was used. It was used to um, become a, um, um, a a talking point or, or something that, um, um, like a virtue a signal that they like like you said. And um, what really um, happens now is you're getting more uh, instability because of it. Because um, I mean, Jerusalem um, historically um, has. Um, had a lot of Palestinians that have always been in the area and there's, there's always been um, uh, conflicts, of course, um, between different groups. But um, for them to, um, to, to move, it, which was a, a move that really doesn't do anything um, to, um, for, for, the, for the benefit of the, the region, all it does is um, uh, creates more infighting amongst different groups and, um, and really just uh, gives uh, more power um, to Israel, which um, in turn, you know, too much power to, to, to one group um, might uh, have consequences because it's really uh, stability in the region that you need. And you need uh, all uh, Middle Eastern countries to, to be able to get along and to be able to um, live alongside each other. And, um, and uh, moves like this um, really uh, threaten uh, relations with other um, countries nearby. And it's interesting to note that Australia is uh, not following the United States on this. Our uh, embassy is also in Tel Aviv and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, will not be moving to Jerusalem, which, uh, you know, even though successive Australian go governments have been, you know, pro-Israel, um, um, you know, uh, pro uh, probably Bob Hawke was our most uh, pro-Israeli pri uh, prime minister, they mm -hmm. you know, understand the, you know, the practicalities uh, of this and, you know, believe that, uh, you know, because, you know, we uh, like most, pe uh, most people say, you know, we want a, you know, two state solution between mm -hmm. uh, Israel, uh, you know, Palestine. And, you know, if you're, mm -hmm. you know, going to, you know, achieve that, you have to be, you know, you, you have to, you know, obviously, you know, better f take steps, you know, not to, you know, provoke uh, tensions. Mm, yes, and uh, I think a two-state solution will end up uh, occurring, um, just a matter of when rather than if. I think it's um, definitely going to be happening within the um, the coming years. The the, the biggest, um, I guess you could say, um, issue to raise is where the borders are going to be, see? So um, a lot of people uh, mention that Jerusalem is going to be split into two and you're going to have like an East Jerusalem and a West Jerusalem, so you're going to have both uh, countries sharing parts of the the, the city. Um, which is a possibility, um, most likely to happen. And, um, I mean, where do the borders lie? Because over many, many years, the borders have continued to change between the countries and um, um, Israel have built a lot more settlements and increased um, their areas. Um, the Palestinians have lost a lot of ground and um, their area is only really tiny. So um, whether they uh, rely on the um, the uh, the borders of... Um, a lot of uh, leaders mentioned the borders of 1967, now, um, if, if they mention the borders of the 60s, um, we'd definitely be looking at a different um, di different situation than we are now because um, at current time, uh, there's been a lot of changes since then. So where the borders lie is, is going to be interesting when they do divide it up into the two-state solution. And uh, that will be something that we'll have to wait and see how it works. But moves like this, just, just there's no practicality in it. It's just um, going to cause tension and... The last thing we need is more wars and, um, you know, I mean, we're only going to be sending more troops over there and uh, fighting battles that really aren't, aren't necessary. Yeah, so. Well, uh, Damien, I've enjoyed having you uh, back on the program. Uh, hopefully we can uh, chat more regularly in the near future.
Yeah, that, that sounds great. Good to be with you. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. The Unshackled is continuing its uh, tradition from last year and having the 2017 Unshackler Awards. There are 10 awards with 10 nominees each, with the winners determined by a poll of our followers and announced on Australia Day. So make sure you vote so we can reward the best and worst contributions for 2017. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.